Okay, so <clears throat> this session then um, is on variational inference, and this is a, a different way to solve Bayesian inverse problems from all of the methods that we've looked at so far. So what I'm going to do um, in this, oh sorry, I should See, I mean, it's me standing here, but actually a huge credit goes to Shin Zhang and Atif Nawaz, who were members of our group in Edinburgh. Um, so what this is all about is trying to estimate, in our case, Bayesian probability distributions, but without using random sampling, or at least trying to minimize that, instead trying to use the uh, class of methods that we call optimization. So... We'd like to, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to, we'd like to estimate these probability distribution, which are random functions in a sense, but use the, the um, optimization libraries available to us. And the reason for that is that these optimization libraries are uh, plentiful, they're well studied, and we understand their convergence characteristics actually far better than we do random sampling algorithms. So. What we're after here, in the end, is we'd like to parameterize the family of all plausible Earth models that are consistent with our data. So that's what we're after when we solve Bayesian inference problems. And I'm going to, today, what I'm just going to do is give you um, a sort of skeleton background in variational inference and how it works and how it's different from the other random sampling methods that we've been talking about. And from then on, I'll talk about, uh, I'll really talk through some examples where we learn about the properties of these methods versus Monte Carlo methods. So I'll compare them uh, directly. Um, and then a couple of applications. So I'll be looking at um, some uh, array data from the seabed of the North Sea, the Grana Array. And all of this will be using travel time tomography as an example. And then finally, if I've got time, I'll go through a full waveform inversion example um, using these methods as well. So this is what we'd like to estimate. It's this Bayesian, um, sorry, okay. It's this, uh, this Bayesian posterior distribution here. And a real problem when we come to deal with random sampling methods is is that uh, Bayes' theorem is fine. It tells us what the posterior distribution is for any model M, but we have to decide which models we're going to actually evaluate this formula for. So it doesn't, unless these are analytic functions and we can literally combine them theoretically, analytically, it doesn't give us an expression for this. We just get a value for this, and actually it's a non, usually a non-normalized value for this, at any particular model's M that we choose to plug in and evaluate. And that's why we use random sampling methods and we start to, to develop smart algorithms to choose different models M to interrogate the structure of this thing. So instead of that, instead of um, stochastic sampling, we're going to try to use a totally different approach. And the way that these variational methods work is we try to fit semi-analytic functions to this. In other words, this has a shape. It's a distribution. Whatever the shape is, it has some shape. And that shape can be described by a function. So we're just going to take a class of functions and try to fit that shape. And that's clearly some kind of optimization problem. We're going to find an optimal shape, a uh, fit to the shape. And that's how we, we set up the methods to use optimization. So the general schema is that we choose a family of functions that we're going to fit to the posterior distribution. So, and we call that family here, we're going to call it Q. Um, and Q is going to have some parameters associated with it, uh, which are the, the, the phi's here, and it's going to be a probability distribution over the model parameters. So we're going to have some family of these functions where it's parameterized by phi. And then uh, one example of that might be the family of just Gaussians. That's the simplest family, perhaps, is just to take the family of all Gaussian distributions. Now, they just have parameters which are the mean and the standard deviation in 1D or the covariances in multi-dimensions. So those are the parameters. And then we try to um, fit 
we try to find the member of that family which is the closest approximation to the posterior distribution. <laughs> How dare you stretch in my talk. <laughs> um, so, uh, right. so, this, so that's, that's an example of what we might do. And in fact, one of the algorithms will do exactly that. So we'll just look at the simplest variational algorithm, which is fitting a Gaussian to the posterior. But of course, there are much more complex things that we can do there. And so here's, that, here's an example. Let's say this is the posterior distribution. It has some, some form, which is Gaussian-ish. And we start with one element from the family of Gaussians. And it's parameterized by the mean and by the standard deviation. Can you see this? Yeah, it's not too bright. Uh, window too bright. Um, so we've got a mean and a standard deviation. And then in an iterative optimization process, we're going to decide how we should change these parameters to better fit the posterior. So we can see the mean is going to have to move this way. And also the standard deviation is going to have to decrease to make it a bit narrower. And so we update it. And then we do it again. Mean moves that way, reduce standard deviation. And gradually we iterate to a best approximation. And that is essentially how variational methods work. So it's completely different from trying to random sample this. Now, obviously, to do this, what we're going to have to have is a measure of the difference between these two distributions. We need to have some way to measure the difference, and then we're going to minimize that difference. That's how we're going to get updates to the parameters. So we'll come back to what that measure is in a moment. So that is the general uh, sort of approach, if you like, to variational methods. Now, there's a second, it, what looks like a second class of methods. Sorry, you can't see down there from the back. I'll, I'll just describe it. That, that, if you like, is the first strategy. Take an analytic form and fit it. The second strategy is to take some um, random samples to begin with, or it could be deterministic samples. It doesn't matter. Some samples of your initial distribution that I had up there, so your initial estimate of the posterior, it could just be your prior. And then describe those by an implicit function. And that could be something like a neural network. It could be a stochastic differential equation. It could be whatever you like. And then move those samples around so that they optimally distribute according to this. So here's an example. Let's say this is my starting point now. I take some random samples according to my, let's say, the prior distribution here. So these are my samples. I don't need to know that initial distribution. I only need to be able to get some samples from it. And now what I do is I look at the difference between these samples and that distribution, and I decide how to move them. And so I start moving the family of samples and I do it in a way which optimizes their distribution so that they are distributed according to the posterior. Now, how we do this, I'll describe in a minute, but that, that is the second strategy. Now, in fact, both of those strategies are using a family of functions to parameterize this distribution. It's just that in the second case, it's implicit within the set of samples. And... Yeah. Just for clarification, but I do not know that last line. No, no. That's the problem. Uh, agreed. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> you, you feel free to say things like that anytime. You're clarifying beautifully. <laughs> I totally agree. Um, we'll work out how to deal with that in a minute. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, where am I? Yeah, so these, these samples, after this approach has been finalized, if you like, are distributed, are self-distributed in some way according to that distribution. And so there is a, an implicit Q of M, our family of, of, of functions, which are represented by those points. Now, in both cases, we're going to have to find a measure of difference between 
this Q, be it explicit or be it implicitly within those points, and this P of M. And this is coming back to what Heiner was getting at. If we don't know P of M, how can we possibly get a difference? So let's come to that next. The difference that we're going to use is called the kullback leibler divergence, and it's given by, or Liebler, sorry, Liebler. Call that Liebler divergence, um, which is given by this formula. It looks a bit complicated, but I'm just going to, to talk through it a little bit. Um, so the callback Liebler divergence sorry, is, is, is something that measures the difference between two probability distributions, Q and P. So Q is our family that, that we're going to consider, and P is the one we're after. And it has these three terms. Now, the last one here is the logarithm of P of D. Now, P of D is the thing that's on the denominator of Bayes' rule. It's called the evidence. And we don't tend to calculate that. In fact, almost all methods in inverse theory are designed to avoid ever calculating that, because that is very expensive to calculate. So that's why Monte Carlo methods only need to compare relative likelihoods for example, to use the metropolis rule or relative uh, prior distributions. They try to avoid having to calculate P of D. And luckily, P of D doesn't depend on the model parameters. So that's going to be constant with regards to any particular set of model parameters. And we're going to use that property in a minute. So whatever it is, it's constant. This one over here is an expectation, so an average, of this in here, which is just Q of M, given the parameters. And Q, remember, is just the current approximation of our posterior. So wherever stage we're at, it's that, that's Q of M. And it's an expectation taken with respect to Q of M. So this whole thing just depends on our, the approximation that we've got so far. So that we can calculate because we know everything there. It's just Q is our family. It doesn't depend on the posterior at all. The only one that depends on the posterior is this one. And this is an expectation or an average of log of the posterior with respect to Q of M. Now that means if I was to evaluate this, let's just take a practical approach. If I want to evaluate that term, I'm going to take some samples of Q of M, which is going to give me some model samples. And for each one, I will use Bayes' rule to estimate P of M given D, and then I'll average those results. And that is what that term is. That, that gives me the answer that I want for that term. So that's a way to estimate this term. And we can do that without knowing analytically what P of M is. We just need samples, just like in Monte Carlo. So in principle, then, this term is is able to be evaluated even without any sort of analytical form for the posterior distribution. And the key is that all of those averages are with respect to Q, the thing that we know, not with respect to P, the thing that we don't know. That's what makes this possible. The nice thing about this measure is that it's always greater than or equal to zero, except when Q is exactly equal to the posterior and then it's zero. So that's perfect. That's exactly what we're looking for, is a measure which decreases until we hit the exactly right answer, and then we hit zero. So minimizing this somehow is going to move our Q so it overlies P as best as possible. Now, this log of evidence, as I said before, is basically computationally intractable, but the nice thing is it's constant. So, Let's just rearrange this equation. So we're going to put all of these terms over on that side, and then we just have the equal sign here, so equals a constant. So that's a negative, so that's going to go positive. That's positive, it's going to go negative. And so we end up with this equation here. Now, because that's constant with respect to Q, and remember Q is the thing we're going to move, it's the distribution we're going to be moving around and warping. Um, what we know is that this kullback liebler term, which we want to minimize, and is always greater than zero, must trade off exactly with this total term here. So if we've got a constant here, if I reduce that, I've got to increase this. If I increase that, I've got to reduce this, because the result is constant. 
What we also know is that this is a positive number. So the optimal case is where q equals p and that goes to zero, and then this is equal to the log of the evidence. That's the best possible case. Otherwise, if this is still positive, then this here must be a lower bound on the evidence. It must, it must approach the evidence from below. That will always be the case. So we call that combination of terms the evidence lower bound or elbow. And it's just defined to be that. And then we can now see how our strategy might be able to work. What we're going to do is we're going to maximize the elbow. And if we do that, we must in turn be minimizing the callback leadler divergence. And the elbow, remember, is just these two terms. That's something we can estimate for any particular distribution Q. And this here is the common strategy for many, many variational methods. Not all, but many are based around this. It's based around uh, maximizing the elbow, the evidence lower bound, because that in turn minimizes the difference between Q and P. I feel like you're about to ask a question. <laughs> So I see that you're, in this equation, you're going to sample the model space um, in P of M. Uh, Q, Q, of, Q of M. In Q of, in Q of M. Individually, and just see how, and just look how this uh, measure behaves. Um, to, to evaluate the measure, we will have to evaluate some samples of Q of M. Yeah. How many? One. In fact, it, it turns, I, I can't remember whether I left the slides in or not, but um, in fact, what, remember what we're going to do here is use optimization algorithms. That means we're actually going to evaluate this many, many times. Every time we do it, we're going to take some samples of this and evaluate this term. Um, and, and indeed, sorry, this term is, is the main one that we're going to evaluate. Um, because we're doing it so many times, we can take a relatively low number of samples here. Now I say one, actually the original paper tested several and tested one. As long as you do the iteration enough times, it will converge with one sample per iteration. Now, of course, you may as well take some more than that if you can afford it. So in what comes up, we take about 20 iteration but it's not millions it's not thousands because we're going to iterate many times so that's the general strategy and okay let's just look at then so so basically these expectations with respect to Q and remember that we choose Q and this is where we can be smart about these algorithms because if we choose Q to be something A that's easy to sample from, could be a Gaussian, could be something completely different from a Gaussian, but which is a, an analytic function, could be quite complicated, but analytic, so that we can sample from it nicely, then we can make very efficient calculations. And we notice that, of course, Bayes' rule is sort of implicit here. It's right there. So the prior is in there, the likelihood's in there, and so on. So we really are getting are optimizing towards a solution of, of what we want. Now then, if we take smart, um, smart choices for Q, we can get extremely efficient algorithms, which are almost analytic. Think where we can invert whole seismic data sets on a laptop. Now, of course, that doesn't work for all problems. And what we're doing there is we're using special properties of different types of functions. So, for example, spatial problems, we might parameterize with things called random Markov fields and all sorts of sort of fancy sounding parameterizations like that. They're actually not as fancy as they sound, but they are very flexible and they're analytic and we can sample from them. They've got all the nice properties that we need. And that suddenly makes things incredibly efficient, but only for certain problems. And so Atif Nawaz did his PhD on these and came up with uh, several examples and several methods to do that for specific types of spatial problems. 
Um, in this talk, I'm going to focus on more general methods to be consistent with the other talks in this uh, course. And we're going to look at cases where we don't use the analyticity of these uh, methods. We're going to look at ones which can be applied more generally. And here's the first one. So I'm just going to go through two, I think, right now. Um, and the first one is called automatic differential variational inference. So we never say that. It's ADVI. And it works like this. And this is the simplest variational algorithm. And it's just fitting a Gaussian, really. So let's say this is the posterior distribution that we don't know. It's something nice and simple, unimodal. And we want to fit a Gaussian to this. Now, the first thing is that in real problems, we often have bounded systems. If it's seismic velocity, there's definitely going to be a zero bound on this. And there's probably an upper bound somewhere, certainly if it's Poisson's ratio and so on. So the first thing we have to do is transform to an unbounded parameter space if we're going to fit a Gaussian. And there are lots of different transforms you can use for that. A simple log transform will do this. It's just a transform of variables. So now, in this unbounded space, we can start with some Gaussian function, the blue curve. Now, we've also transformed the red curve, but we don't know that. But that has been transformed implicitly by changing to this set of variables. In ADVI, what we do is we first of all normalize this, the transform, essentially, to move to the case where the Gaussian is, is a standard Gaussian, which means centered on zero with standard deviation one. That makes the optimization incredibly efficient if you do that. And so you fit the Gaussian very, very rapidly with very few samples um, of, the, of the distribution. And then you transform back. And that, it's as simple as that. So that is a variational method, completely different from random sampling methods, except we've used random samplers to estimate the parameters. And Klaus talked about this, you know, how many samples one needs to estimate a Gaussian. Um, but in this case, we know we're looking for a Gaussian. So we know it's, we, we assume that we're looking for a Gaussian, and so that allows us to constrain the number of parameters. So that's ADVI and how it works. Um, it's clearly an optimization method. We're just maximizing the elbow. When we do this fit, that is maximizing the elbow between those two distributions using the formula you saw previously. Here's a second algorithm, Stein variational gradient descent. So we say SVGD. And um, in this one, it's taking strategy number two where we don't have an explicit function, we have a set of samples, and we're going to optimize those samples. So in this case, we start with um, a, se uh, a set of random samples according to, distributed according to our prior, which is just, in this case, a Gaussian-like function. And in this simple analytic case, let's say this is the posterior we're trying to find. To maximize the elbow, we can uh, work out which directions we have to move the particles, and I'll come back to exactly how we do that in a moment. Um, and after five iterations of moving those particles around, we've already got this as the histogram of the particles. After 500, it's essentially fit to within this level of discretization. So that's the second strategy, and that's uh, Stein variational gradient descent. I mean, there are other ways to do this, but I'm just giving you an example of two, which represent these two different types of strategies. It's optimization rather than uh, random sampling in, in every, at every iteration. And here is an example of it working in 2D, just to give you a real flavor of how, of what's really happening. I don't know if you can see at the back, but there is a light blue sort of shaded banana-like structure there, um, which is going to be the posterior that we don't know. We start with a Gaussian-like distribution of samples. And the way that we calculate how to move these samples, it turns out that we can form a system where all of the particles are aware of all the other particles, and they redistribute themselves as a cloud. So it's not each particle trying to go in an optimal direction. They are redistributing together to represent that distribution. So if I just do that, you see them redistributing. You guys can't see anything, can you? Why didn't you say we can shut the curtains? <laughs> I just realized. <laughs> okay, let me uh, 
we'll let it run again. Can you see it now? <laughs> Can anyone see it? Can you see it at the back? <laughs> I mean, the black things, yes, the things in the shadow are less. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. So it's just self-optimizing here. So there it is. And now the vectors just show the gradient directions for this, for this cloud to redistribute. And what you can see, if you look carefully, I can show you later on, um, they're all self-organizing as they move to redistribute according to this. So this is, again, not random sampling. This is optimal sampling, which is a totally different game. Um, and I'm going to compare some results of these methods with just uh, various uh, or a couple of types of metropolis hastings. We're going to, I'm going to use very basic metropolis hastings with a Gaussian um, uh, sampling distribution, uh, proposal distribution, as we saw, uh, I think, in Klaus's proposal yesterday. And then I'll also compare with Thomas' um, Monte Carlo method that we saw this morning and some of the examples, just to get a feeling for where these methods sit in the spectrum of optimization methods. And here is an example that I like to use because um, we're going to do tomography on this. And it's an example where we've got a, a real circle which lies outside of the space of any parameterized gridded model. So the, the actual structure lies outside of the parameterization. You'll see a ring of um, triangles. These are going to be used as, a source, used as sources and receivers. So we're going to get travel times between every pair of those. And those travel times are what we're going to use to image the interior. So let's just see how the different methods work. So first of all, ADVI, the one that's just fitting a Gaussian. So remember, the Gaussian just in the end has a mean and a variance, a covariance matrix. And um, here is a map. I mean, the mean is, is a, a mapped structure. So this is actually the mean of that Gaussian. And this is the standard deviation, so the diagonal elements of that, that Gaussian covariance matrix. Now, you can see various things here, which when we first saw them were a bit worrying. First of all, the color of that is not the same as the color of that. They give different values for the, the slowness here. Also, if you look, there's a faint halo around about in the mean structure that doesn't exist in the true model. And the standard deviation is what it is. We, we have no uh, idea what that should be at this stage. So at this point, we're not sure whether it's right or not. So now let's compare it with the results of SVGD, the other variational method, the sampling one. And this is what SVGD gives us. And SVGD also gives us exactly the same value and the halo here. Now, these are completely different methods. They're really totally different methods. If they give the same result, we can be fairly sure in this high dimensional space, we can be pretty sure that that is what the mean looks like. And this is um, really a very good illustration that the mean itself is not a model. I mean, it can be a model, it can be a valid model, but it doesn't have to be. And Thomas, when what you showed this morning, the mean was not a model at all. It was just a statistic of the distribution. And there's no reason for the mean to be a good estimator of the structure. Remember, what we're trying to do here is not estimate the structure. We know we can't do that. We're trying to estimate the family of models which are consistent with the data. And so the mean and the standard deviation parameterize that family. They don't estimate the model. So we now we're pretty sure that the, this is the right mean. Strangely, the mean of the, the correct structure has, has this, this halo. And it appears both in ADVI when we constrain this to be Gaussian-like and in SVGD when we don't. These are just particles, just models that are optimized. However, the standard deviation is completely different in each case. The ADVI results have much lower standard deviations than the uh, SVGD results. But now we see something even more strange, perhaps, which is that we get this double halo of higher uncertainties in the standard deviation. So now we're pretty sure this is right, but what about this? And this is now a good illustration of the fact that in Bayesian problems, we have an, a, a, a real philosophical issue. Um, it's both practical and philosophical, and that is, Whenever you estimate a Bayesian solution, you're estimating a probability distribution. You never 
know whether you've got it right. You never know whether your algorithms got stuck. And that goes for all methods. Because there, there isn't even a really non-linear test function where we know what the answer is. We don't know what the posterior distributions are. There's no analytic test case, except for linear ones and very simple ones. So now here we are, we're up against it. Is this right or not? And at this point, we don't know. The only thing we can do is try a third method and keep going. Because if we use completely different methods and arrive at the same solution, then we can be confident. So here's Metropolis Hastings. Simple Metropolis Hastings run forever until it roughly converged and look, out pops the double halo. So now this is a random sampling method. The second one was an optimization sampling method. The first one was, was fitting a Gaussian. So this must be right. Whatever that structure is in detail, I don't know, but that, that general structure must be correct. Now then, just for comparison, um, because we also used Thomas' uh, algorithm. We ran it with that, and look. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect result. Tiny uncertainties. Why has that happened? Thomas is not allowed to answer. <laughs> Was that the implicit smoothing that you mentioned? It's exactly the implicit smoothing. That's, that's why I asked my question. I'm sorry, I was leading up to this. <laughs> The implicit smoothing, the, I mean, remember that this, this solution was found using Voronoi cells, which are iterating, and then it's the average of all of those in space. So um, in each one of those cells, we have complete smoothness, and then the boundaries are sharp. And, and we used exactly the same parameterization as Thomas showed you this morning. Um, and in this case, it's exactly right. This is a structure which is smooth with one sharp boundary. So the prior information that we've injected implicitly in this algorithm is exactly correct for the structure we're looking for. And that prior information is incredibly powerful. So Klaus showed us that when we were estimating a Gaussian, and we know it's a Gaussian, we're using samples, we can do that with n times n minus 1 over 2 samples. If we don't know if the Gaussian, if that's a Gaussian in 100 dimensions, we will never stop sampling if we want to find that Gaussian. It'll take, what was it, 100 years, or I can't remember. Maybe it was 10 to the power 81 years. I can't remember what it was. So the prior information is incredibly powerful. And in this case, you can just see that as a, as a very clear example. If I know that my structure is piecewise constant and I put that in, I'm going to do much better than an algorithm that doesn't know that. So while this is great here, the question is what will happen when we apply it in the real Earth, which is not necessarily piecewise smooth, but it can be. And we'll see an example in a moment. Let me come back to the ones that don't inject that information. So we're just dealing with gridded systems here, a square gridded system here. So we've got uh, Metropolis Hastings, SVGV, and so on. And here's just, um, take from this what you want, but it's the number of simulations we had to use for each of these methods to get a stable result. So ADVI, 10,000, SVGD, 400,000, the Metropolis Hastings, the basic one, 12 million. And we ran the reversible jump for 3 million. We probably could have stopped earlier. It's very subjective, that this, to, you know, because at some point you stop because it looks like it's stabilized. But, you know. The point is, this one here, although it takes a low number of simulations, the ADVI gives you a good estimate of the mean, but a very, uh, an underestimate of the uncertainties. So we're going to tend to not use that one unless we want to use that as a starting model to then move on to something else for Bayesian methods. And the reversible jump one, um, I'm not going to compare that with others because it's kind of unfair. <laughs> it's an unfair comparison because in that case, uh, we've injected so much prior information that, was, that is consistent. That, I mean, I'll, I'll show a result on some real data in a minute and you'll see that it's, it's a bit different from the others. So these two middle ones are really the ones that um, I'm going to focus on. Um, actually, that's not even true. I'm, I'm going to show the reversible jump one all the way through, I've just realized. So here's a real data example. This is an array, uh, 200, or 350 stations on the bottom of the sea, in the North Sea. Uh, we recorded ambient noise on these for a few days, 
The red ones we then used as virtual sources, and we calculated travel times between the red ones and all the blues ones. So we just had a set of travel times, and we're going to do tomography in 2D across the seafloor for a certain period, and I can't remember exactly what period. It's probably around 1 to 2 hertz, something like that. Um, and these are the results. So I'm just going to jump straight to results. So ADVI, this is the mean structure, and this is the standard deviation. We don't know whether that's true or not, so we try another method. SVGD gives us a similar mean structure, similar to the, the synthetic example. We expect that the mean from ADVI is quite good, and it appears to be, because it's very consistent with SVGD. And the, uns the uncertainties have increased. The standard deviations that we get using SVGD have increased, which is what we expect again, because ADVI underestimates uncertainty. And then, in this case, we couldn't even apply Metropolis Hastings, the basic one. It just never converged. I mean, we tried. It ran for 20 million iterations and never got anywhere near converging. So the only thing we could apply was, was the algorithm Tomas showed us, and this is what you get from that one. And you can see that it's definitely seeing the same structure. Here, if I just go backwards and forwards on the mean, um, but it's smoother. And there again is your intrinsic smoothness that's been put in to the transdimensional Voronoi cells, essentially. That, that's the implicit smoother that's in there. And if we compare the uncertainties, by the way, this is 0 0.06. It's now gone to 0 0.03, and it's gone to dark blue. It's way down here. So uh, just as was explained this morning, when we reduce the number of parameters, our uncertainties go down, um, potentially, we have over-smoothed here, but of course we don't know what the true structure is. But the other two structures, the other two methods both give us slightly more detailed means, but whether we can uh, trust the uncertainties is another, another matter. So you can see how, anyway, the, the niche that these all fall into, this is the only, the trans-dimensional Monte Carlo is the only one we could run for this. So if there's any weakness to do with inject, having to inject prior information, the strength is that it runs. It's efficient. And so that's a trade-off that we always have. Um, and the other two, uh, well, we can see that they, they agree in the means. And what we still don't have in this case is we've got two means that agree, but we don't have yet two uncertainties that agree. We need another method, one that doesn't inject the prior information here that we've used in the transdimensional one one that we can compare directly with these first two. But this is, this is a fundamental problem with Bayesian imaging or Bayesian inverse problems, is, is having a test case where you know what the answer should be. We almost never have it. So let's just quickly then see what happens when we apply these variational methods to full waveform inversion. So here's a, a test model um, with some test data. We just fire some sources and receivers at the top, and we've got um, uh, the forward problem is to estimate the waveforms, the inverse problem is to estimate this, the, the structure or the, or the family of structures that, um, that are consistent with the data. And I'm just going to show you the results of um, that we did a few years ago, which was trying to replicate the results of Lars Gebrad and Andreas Fichtner and others, that, and they did this with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. At least we wanted to compare our method to theirs, because, of course, they had worked out a posterior distribution for this FWI problem, but they don't know if it's right either because they didn't compare it with anything else. And they have no idea whether it's correct. So we thought, okay, here's an opportunity. Let's get two fully nonlinear methods, totally different, and compare them. So there's a structure. It's a simple structure. It's VP, VS, and density. In fact, the sources here are going to be down below, and uh, the receiver's above, so it's a transmission problem. Um, and there's a P wave, typical waveform. There's an S wave wave. Oh, no, sorry. That's a vertical and a horizontal waveform, I think. Um, we've got, so it's a fully elastic problem. And there are 180 times 60 times 1, 2, 3 parameters. So there are a lot of parameters here. This is unsampleable from the cursor dimensionality point of view. Nevertheless, they went ahead and tried it. And so we went ahead and tried it with this other method. Um, the likelihood function was just a Gaussian on the waveforms, um, a Gaussian error. And let's just look at the results. So these are the results from SVGD. So the mean structure for the P wave, the S wave, and the density. 
And what you can see is the S wave structure and the density is pretty well resolved, but the P wave structure is not. And that's probably because these sources were all double coupled sources. They, they, they produced a lot of shear um, and perhaps not so much P wave energy. It's the P wave energy was probably produced by conversions. Um, the standard deviations are shown here. Again, we see a similar thing, large standard deviations on the P wave structure. And the, those on the other structures uh, follow the structure to some extent, follow the, the corresponding structure we can see. We don't know if these are right, so let's compare them to what Lars found, and that's that. So now we have two completely independent methods showing very similar structures. The what, sorry? Why, why is the density well recovered? Well recovered. Why? why? In, in fact, the density is, if you look at it carefully, it's not well recovered. The colors aren't the same. Yeah. <laughs> so the structure of the density is, yeah, the structure of the density is well recovered, but the absolute value is not. So, yeah, it's, it's density is hard. Anyway, so both methods give similar, similar results. Here's a comparison of the means and the... Uh, but notice that these are from a totally different number of samples. So Lars used 10,000 samples. We used lots of um, evaluations, but in the end, only end up with 600 samples. But the difference is that they are random samples and these are optimally distributed samples. So they give a similar, hopefully, kind of structure, yeah. So in your method, do you assume just one Gaussian? No, no, this is SVGD, so this is the sampling one where we're optimizing the sample. Yeah, yeah. So we haven't bothered with ADVI because we know it's going to give the wrong answer in this case. <laughs> um, and the standard deviations. So uh, that's it. So I just introduced variational inference and a couple of methods, but there are lots of other methods. There is a, a stochastic version of SVGD. Um, Mixture density neural networks, I was going to introduce them, but actually tomorrow, because you're looking at neural networks tomorrow, I decided to leave those out. Normalizing flows are an extension of ADVI that embeds neural networks within them, a special type of neural network, and, and a variety of others. So this is a, it, what I'm trying to get across here is it's a different strategy for solving Bayesian problems that involves optimization, and there are lots of flavors, just as you've seen over the last they are two for, say, Monte Carlo or for linearized methods. There are different flavors. Um, and that's it. I'll just say that these are really underexplored in seismology. So if you're interested, give it a shot. It's worth it. And at least then you get a totally independent answer from your, your sampling, uh, your random sampling solution to see whether they agree. Okay. Thanks.